All right. Oh, I can hear my echo, so that means it's working. <laughs> Good morning. Now, I know already that some of you already don't like me preaching, even though I haven't started yet, even though I've never preached here before, because you'll notice that your notes page in your bulletin looks a little different today. And I know how change can go over with some people, so <laughs> bear with me a little bit this morning, because it is by design, I promise. I know normally you're looking for a word up on the screen to fill, um, you're waiting for that, you know, number one, number two, or with Alan, number 27. Um, <laughs> 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 oh, we love you, Pastor, I promise. <laughs> but this morning, I want to challenge you guys a little bit different. You'll see that your notes page is just, it's blank. It's got a bunch of lines on it, so it's supposed to replicate uh, just a line sheet of paper. But I want to challenge you guys this morning, if you are note takers, if you're not, that's okay too. Write down whatever it is that sticks out to you today. I don't want to tell you what to write down. Not that that's wrong. But this morning, I want to leave that up to God this morning. So. Amen. Amen. You'll also notice that there's no Scripture on there. Now, before we get into this, we are going to be reading from the Bible today, I promise. <laughs> I don't want you thinking that we're not going to, because I made that mistake one time in youth group. I tell you, by the end of youth group, they were planning my funeral. <laughs> so, parents... Don't stress, your, parent or your kids do understand the importance of the Bible, so that is the good thing to take away from that. But the reason is because we're going to play a little game in a bit, but we'll get there in a second. You know, as I was working on this sermon, I kept thinking about when I would help my dad in kids' church when I was younger. He was the children's pastor at our church when I was a teenager, and so I would often go in and help him out. And one of the things that he would frequently do is what we call sword drills. Now, I know that some of my teens are either smiling or groaning because we do sword drills, or we have been doing sword drills in youth group for every Wednesday for the past couple of months. And some of them ask for it, and some of them don't. Um, but they're a lot of fun. Um, and if you don't know what a sword drill is, it's essentially you take your Bible, and you hold it with your pages facing towards heaven, and I would give my teens a word. And as soon as I say charge... They have to race to find that word in the book or in the Bible as quickly as they can. And then the first one to stand up and read their verse gets a piece of candy, and the first three get to read their verse out loud. But in kids' church, in kids' church, words were a little bit difficult for them to do. So we did books of the Bible. He would say a book of the Bible, and we would have to race to find that book in the Bible first. And almost every single time we did one of these, my dad did one of those books that he thought was a fun book. Now, a fun book to him was not one that, you know, he liked the stories in. It wasn't one that, you know, it had a lot of funny words in it. No. The books of the Bible that he thought were fun were the, fun, were the ones that were fun to say. Books like Ecclesiastes or lamentations. And he would always follow it up 
by saying, ooh, now that's fun to say. <laughs> and the book that we're going to be going over today was one of those books. And to help us find this book, I thought it'd be kind of fun to do one massive sword drill with everyone here. So, if you brought your Bibles, get them out. And I'm actually going to need a little bit of help because I do not have the ability to look at 300 people all at once. So, they don't know I'm going to do this, but if any of my teens are out there and have done sword drills with me before, I would like them to come up so they can help me look. Yes, that means all of you guys. <laughs> All right, so like I said, I'll re-go over the rules just so you understand. You're going to hold your Bibles up in the air, pages towards heaven, and you cannot go until I say charge. No, not yet. Not that time, because I haven't given you the word yet. <laughs> okay, you guys down here, I need you to help me figure out who are the first three, Okay. Now, when you have it, stand and come up here, and I have a prize for you. <laughs> and if you can't stand, if, then we'll have somebody come to you. Cool? Okay? Just raise your Bible back up in the air. Cool? All right. The book that we are going to be in today is Habakkuk. Well, not yet, not yet, not yet. Cheaters. <laughs> Goodness! <laughs> Explain the rules twice. <laughs> <We're listening. laughs> Habakkuk. Charge. <laughs> All right. Who are the first three? All right. Come on up. We got to check. We got to check. Make sure you're not cheating. <laughs> I wasn't going to play, but you said you had candy. I do have candy, yes. All right. Perfect. Perfect. And then last one. Perfect. All right. Here you are. I'm diabetic. Have you got something like coins or dollar bills? <laughs> I do not, unfortunately. <laughs> got excited about the candy and forgot to take your candy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Now, if you didn't win, don't give up because that's where we're going to be reading from today. So continue to find it if you haven't yet. Not only is Habakkuk really fun to say, because it is, so fun to say that you know, depending on who you ask, you might find that it's pronounced a couple different ways, um, but it is also one of, if not my favorite book in all of Scripture. Now, for those who don't know a lot about Habakkuk, he was a prophet around 600 B.C., um, and if you haven't found it yet, it's the fifth book back from the, old, from the back of the Old Testament. So it's in the second half. Um, teeny tiny little book. It's only about three chapters. So you may have to look for a second. But Habakkuk became a prophet when King Josiah was king of Israel. Now, King Josiah was seen as a good king, right? In fact, he was the one who reinstituted the law of Moses uh, after the temple was destroyed in the previous regime, they restored it and they found a copy of the law. And they were so grieved when they found it because they realized that they hadn't been living the right way. And so in his reign, they reinstituted this law and started living by the Lord again. 
So it was a great time. King Josiah was a great king. However, three years into Habakkuk's run as a prophet, King Josiah died. And after he died, people quickly fell far away from the Lord again. And this frustrated him a ton. The people he once knew who were so obedient to the Lord, now going by their own way all over again. They're now throwing everything that they worked for away. And that brings us to the beginning of his book. Starting in chapter 1, verse 2, we read, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, then there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we can all kind of relate to Habakkuk a little bit here. How often have you looked around and thought, you know, why is there so much sin in this world? Why is this being allowed to happen? Why are we allowing, even a lot of times, our church do the things that they do? Why are you allowing your people to do this? So it makes sense. And this is, this is why I love Habakkuk so much, because he's relatable. He's a prophet. Prophets are mostly, you know, they hear from God, and they're the ones that bring out God's word among the people. And yet here Habakkuk is, he's not talking to his people at all. In fact, he doesn't talk to his people at all in his book. The whole book is a conversation with God about this problem. So, then we get the Lord's response. In verse 5, it says, The Lord replied, Look around at the nations, look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away, and like eagles, they swoop down to devour their prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn at their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like wind and are gone, but they are deeply guilty, for their own strength is their God. So now... Not only do we have Habakkuk essentially asking God, God, what are you doing? I'm asking you about, you know, I'm trying to talk to you. I'm trying to get a hold of you because there's so much sin going on with my people, and you're just not answering. You're not doing anything. And God responds by saying, (laughs) oh, I am. Not only am I doing something, but I'm about to do something that you wouldn't believe. I'm raising up this people who are going to punish my people for all the things that they have been doing, whether they know it or not. But this passage raises up a really, really interesting question. Why would God use the people of Babylon? I mean, he literally said it himself. They are cruel. They're guilty. Why would God use these people? Does, if God is all good and all, you know, never, nothing he ever does is bad, how can he use somebody that's bad? And this is where we get this idea twisted. You see, 
What God is saying here is don't worry. Don't worry about them. And we see that Habakkuk is thinking the same thing we are. Like I said, he's a pretty relatable dude. As soon as you're thinking it, he's saying it. Because in verse 12, he says, O Lord my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out. O Lord, my rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Are we only fish to be caught and killed? Are we only creatures that have no leader? Must we be strung up on their hooks and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? Then they will worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are the gods who have made us rich, they will claim. Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquests? This is pretty much exactly how we usually question when God does this. And like I said, it's because we have the whole thing turned around. God isn't saying here that he's just, you know, he's going to use bad people because his people are bad. He's essentially telling them, don't worry about Babylon. I'll deal with them later. Right now I'm worried about you guys. Because you people are my chosen people, and I care more right now about you guys being corrected than they. So what he's saying here is actually one of, in my opinion, the coolest things that God can do, and that's use the wrong decisions that people make for good. Isn't that crazy that you can even make the wrong decision and somehow God can still figure out how to use it for good? So yeah, God can use bad things, but he uses them in the best way possible. And we figure out, way later, eventually, that Babylon does not last very long. So if you're still worried about the success that they are having, it is short-lived. All evil success is short-lived. It will not last. Amen. That's right. mm-hmm. So, we get God's response. In chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness of God. Wealth is treacherous, and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave, and like death, they are never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and swallowed many peoples. And then from verses 6 to 17, so a little over 10 verses, he sits there and explains how his people have done wrong. And then he hits us with, the punchline in verse 18. What good is an idol carved by man or a cast image that deceives you? How foolish to trust in your own creation, a God that can't even talk. You see, what's interesting about this response is that it doesn't seem like he's, at, he's answering his question at all. (laughs) He's like, why are all these people, like, all these people are succeeding? And he's just like, well, you guys are still bad. And that's exactly what I said before, what he's telling him. You guys are the ones that need correcting. 
And I wasn't there, but I imagine that this response right here hit Habakkuk right between the eyes. Because yes, he's talking about his people here, but he's also talking to Habakkuk. I mean, imagine complaining to God and then God hitting you with, the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave and like death, they are never satisfied. Church, are we never satisfied? Now, I don't want you to hear this thinking that I'm like, you know, I'm sitting up here and I'm preaching down at you guys. I'm sitting here telling like, oh, you know, you guys all need to work on this. <laughs> no. <laughs> Believe me, I'm right there with you. This is not just a you guys thing. This is an all of us thing. Believe me. But this is why I love this book so much. Because no matter how many times I read through this, there's two lines that stick out to me every time. And that is, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. How foolish to trust in your own creation. How foolish to trust in yourself. Amen. Who do you trust in? Because I hate to break it to you, we don't have anything, everything figured out, and we never will. <laughs> and there is one being who does. And yet we still sit here and only trust what we can understand. I mean, it makes sense to us to think that way because, you know, we see it, we hear it, you know, all the senses going off so we can understand it, but we just cannot fathom what we can't see, hear, and understand. And that is where we get the, pa the, the beatitude, blessed are those who believe and yet they don't see says it to Thomas. That's why this is, that was so powerful because most people can believe in the things that they see and hear. But we can't understand everything that happens. We're physically not able to. The biggest mistake that we make as humans is only trusting in what we can understand and trusting in the things that we do. Imagine, for example, if, imagine you have a seed and you want that seed to grow into a big, strong, and healthy plant. We're told that if you put that seed in good soil, put it in the correct sunlight, and water it however many times that it will grow into this big and strong and healthy plant. But our mistake is sitting there and saying, I did that. I gave it the water. I put it in the soil. I put it in good sunlight. I made that plant what it is today. <laughs> we didn't do anything except do what God told us to do. We are no more a part of that process as the water and the sun and the soil. We are a vessel, and that's a blessing, but we can't let it get to our heads. This is where we get the shift in Habakkuk. 
starting in chapter 3, verse 2. He says back, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help is, a, help is again as you did in years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. I see God moving across the deserts of Edom, the Holy One coming from Mount Paran. This brilliant splendor fills the heavens, and the earth is filled with his praise. His coming is as brilliant as the sunrise rays of light flashing from his hands, where his awesome power is hidden. Pestilence marches before him, plague follows close behind, and when he stops, the earth shakes. When he looks, the nations tremble. He shatters the everlasting mountains and levels the eternal hills. He is the eternal one. Now, if you're struggling with how to begin trusting in the Lord over yourself, this is how you start. Understand and recognize who God is. You see, we get caught up in these patterns of how we do things. We're told that this is how it works, and then we do it, and every single time it happens the same way. But we fail to recognize that the one being that can make those laws of nature falter is the one controlling everything. He can level mountains that have been here for thousands of years. And the next step, if you jump to verse 14, Habakkuk says, with his own weapons, you destroyed the chief of those who rushed out like a whirlwind thinking Israel would be easy prey. You trampled the sea with your horses and the mighty waters piled high. I trembled inside when I heard this. My lips quivered with fear and my legs gave way beneath me. Now notice the shift from past to future tense here. I will wait quietly for the coming day when disaster will strike the people who invade us. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the field and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon heights." Even though Habakkuk is going to be staring down death and destruction, even though Babylon is knocking on their door, he will still rejoice in the Lord. Even though the fig trees have no blossoms, it doesn't matter. Even though the fields lie empty and even though the flocks are dying, it doesn't matter. Because he knows, like Babylon's success, all of this is only temporary. Because God promises us, and I don't know if you know, but when God promises something, he will stick to it. <laughs> he promises us that everything will be okay in the end. And that's what we can hold to. That's where we get this peace from, no matter what happens is because we know that no matter what happens, he will remain. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. Now, being satisfied is not something that everyone can just do. It's a practice. It's a discipline. And believe me, it is not easy at times. But I promise you, no matter what you go through, it is still possible to be satisfied. I want to close with a story. Do any of you remember those sayings that your parents would tell you growing up that just drove you crazy when they would tell you because they said it over and over again and you're like, I'm sick and tired of hearing this. Whenever I got mad when I was younger, 
my mom would always tell me, well, it's your choice to be upset about that, and oh my word, oh, it made me mad. Like, what do you mean it's my choice? Did you not see that I just scraped my knee on the ground? Did you not see that I just cost my team the game in basketball? It's my choice? Are you kidding me? I hated when she would tell me this. A couple years ago, I heard a story that completely made, changed my perspective. It finally made me understand what she was saying. This is a story about a lady named Mabel. It's from a book written by John Ortberg called The Life You've Always Wanted, which my teens probably recognize because that's what we're going through in Sunday school right now. But he talks about a point in his life when he would go and visit a state-run conveyance and hospital about once or twice a week. Now, if any of you don't know what that is, is basically filled with people who are waiting to die. And he walked in one day, and he saw what he described as the most horrible sight he has ever laid eyes on. It was a woman strapped up in a wheelchair. Her empty stare and white pupils showed that she was blind. Her large hearing aid over her one ear showed that she was mostly deaf. And one side of her face was being eaten by cancer. There was a discolored sore that was running and covering part of her cheek. And it had pushed her nose to one side, dropped one eye, and distorted her jaw so that what should have been the corner of her mouth was actually the bottom of her mouth. Because of this, she drooled constantly. In fact, this, in, this particular woman was so bad that when new nurses arrived, they would have them go and take care of her for a day because if they could take care of her, if they could stand that sight and that smell, they could handle anything that walked through those doors. Later, he learned that she was 89 years old and she had been bedridden, blind, nearly deaf, and alone for 25 years. This was Mabel. He reluctantly walked up to her and put a flower in her hand and said, here's a flower for you. Happy Mother's Day. And she responded, thank you, but can I give it to someone else? I can't see because I'm blind. So he wheeled her down the hallway until he found an alert patient, and she handed them the flower and said, here, this is from Jesus. This is when he realized that this was no ordinary person. He and Mabel became friends over the next few weeks as he made it a point to go and see her um, about once or twice a week. Now, her roommates were all human vegetables who screamed occasionally but never talked. They often wet themselves, and because the hospital was often understaffed, especially on Sunday when he would go and visit, the stench was feral, to say the least. However, whenever he went, Mabel was always in a positive mood. He would read the Bible to her, and when he would pause, she would continue reciting the passages from memory, word for word. And all the time he spent with her, she never spoke of loneliness or pain. He said, it was not many weeks before he went from feeling a sense of being helpful to a sense of awe and wonder over what he was witnessing. During one particularly hectic week where he felt like his mind was being pulled in about 10 different directions, he thought, what does Mabel think about day after day, week after week, year after year? And so he asked her, 
And she said this, I think about my Jesus. I think about how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me in my life, you know. I'm one of those who is mostly satisfied. Lots of folks wouldn't care for what I think. Lots of folks would think I'm kind of old-fashioned. But I don't care. I'd rather have Jesus. He's all the world to me. Now, I just want you to imagine that. I want you to imagine being in her position. You can't see. You can hardly hear. You can't walk. In fact, you can't even lean over. You have to be strapped to your chair. And no one's come and visited you in 25 years. And you say... I think about how good he's been to me. I am one who is mostly satisfied. I read you that story this morning because if Mabel can be satisfied with her life, so can we. It is possible to be satisfied because of who God is. Because nothing you are going through can stand up to him. Because what I don't want you to hear this morning is me trying to belittle what you guys may be going through. I know that there are a lot of really, really difficult things that life can throw at you. And I'm sorry. Truly and deeply, I am so sorry that you go through these things in your life. But what I want you guys to hear is that these things are so small to God. He knows how it's going to work out. He knows how things are going to happen. And he knows that if you stay faithful to him, you will prosper when it counts. When you truly trust in the Lord, it may take some time, but just watch as you become more and more satisfied with how your life goes. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, as we always do, for this place that we can come together and meet this place that we can be together as like-minded believers and worship you and hear from you. God, we thank you for Habakkuk and the ability to relate to a prophet from the Bible. We thank you for his words, and I pray that we can all follow his example and that our faith shall not waver no matter what happens in our lives. Because God, we know who you are and we believe in who you are. God, we know that you are more powerful and you are greater and more holy than anything that we can see on this earth. So God, we thank you and I pray that we are reminded of this day in and day out as we go. Thank you for who you are and everything that you do, everything that you've done, and everything that you're going to do going forward for us. In your holy, precious, wonderful name, amen. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>